All right, and welcome to the next episode of FinOps Fridays. Today, I am here with Mike to talk all about containers. Uh, there's been a lot of fuss, a lot of talk around containers. Are they the magic silver bullet? Are they gonna help us a whole heap with optimization? Or are they just another shared resource that we're gonna have to worry about and work out how we allocate everything? Uh, so Mike, take us through a quick introduction of yourself, uh, where you've been in your experience specifically around uh, containers. My name is Mike Serma. I work for New Relic and I run our cloud cost optimization team. Been with New Relic for just shy of seven years now and um, been in the tech industry for about 30. Uh, so we started with uh, containers at New Relic when uh, containers were kind of brand new. I believe the first version of, of Docker that ran at New Relic was like 0.6. So uh, a little bit of the bloody edge there for, for New Relic, and we def definitely had some challenges. Um, when I started New Relic, we had uh, Docker running kind of bare in bare metal, and we moved to Mesos and Marathon, which was exciting and challenging in our own data centers. And now we run containers and Kubernetes in AWS using EKS. Gotcha, excellent. Good, good history. You, you got on them quite early in the day. Um, has the rest of the organization always been fully across them? For the most part, yes. It's, it's, it was the broadest adoption possible. We, we had certain applications in our stack that weren't capable of moving when we were running on bare metal. But once we started that migration to the cloud, then they followed with that and they were like the first ones to move to the cloud and they moved in that manner. Gotcha, awesome. All right, so let's get into it. Let's talk some containers. Uh, for those, you know, we, we have an audience with a very diverse background. So everyone's been talking about tank containers. As I said, there's been a huge push and a huge hype that they can potentially give us so much around the area of FinOps optimization specifically. Some people, of course, are selling them as the silver bullet and solve a lot of cost issues. Mike, for, for the audience, for the broader audience, give us a bit of a one-on-one on a container. What actually is a container? What's the sort of practical implication of what it's like in, in business? Is it sort of like virtualization on virtualization? It's just another step of being able to sort of divide resources. What exactly are they and why are they important? I would characterize it more like a thinner version of a virtualization of a VM because um, you don't have all of the overhead of the VM with the operating system. And I tend to often think of a container as your deployment artifact. It's like the, the amalgamation of your RPMs in the traditional Linux world or whatever your package manager might have been and your VM all layered together into one object that you can then deploy. Gotcha. So, so yeah, it's that sort of self, I wouldn't say container view, it's probably a bad choice of word, but it's, it's all packaged together <laughs> that can be moved around to different hardware, but you don't need that really heavy OS abstraction layer between it. It's a much lighter version. Right. Exactly. Gotcha. Uh, and what are the basic sort of flavors and types of virg virtualization, EKS we hear in Kubernetes, um, what's actually out there in industry? Um, uh, VMware is kind of the, the stalwart, if you will. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Um, but that's the, you know, the original virtualization platform. Um, then you have uh, Docker containers, which is kind of the, the, the entry point into containerization. LXC containers is where that's drawn from, which is built into the Linux kernel. Um, and then moving beyond that, you have you know, Mesos and Marathon was the, the next kind of foray into that container orchestration layer. And then beyond that was into Kubernetes, and uh, which is what is kind of, I think, all the rage in, in the space today is to use that as your orchestration layer and, and it manages your infrastructure for you in some regard. And in terms of those, yeah, th those different flavors and types, are they fundamentally the same? Uh, you know, just different, different particular vendors, or is there some big fundamental differences between some of those types? Obviously, VMware probably excluded from that list, but the others, are they, are they basically the same concept and just slightly different tweaks? In, in large respects, yes. Like it, moving from our own managed Kubernetes clusters in AWS to EKS was a relatively light lift, right? Because you're just shifting 
what you run in that environment, right? Um, we, in that environment, what was attractive to us is we don't have to own that control plane and upgrading the control plane and dealing with all of those pieces of the puzzle. Gotcha, yep. Um, and why are you seeing, so now that we've got a, a basic understanding, like what's the point of them? Why, why are you seeing people use them? And what benefits are they really providing to the business? I mean, tech people love to just jump on anything shiny, but what is what are the benefits these are giving to the actual business and why should we be looking a bit deeper on them? For us, it gives us a lot of agility, the ability to deploy them across a really large fleet. Uh, the, the change cycle for that is very fast, right? To, to build a new Docker image is really fast compared to a, your traditional VM image or deploying a full OS to a piece of hardware. So the, the window of time that it takes you to do a deployment when you need to do many deployments in a given time frame, that it really draws down on that for you. Gotcha, so you're just packaging up your application and dependencies, building versions of that, deploying it versus a VM that's your application dependencies, operating system, drivers, and everything else together, so to speak. Correct. Gotcha. Um, and in terms of the benefits, so you've got that agility from a FinOps perspective, how does that agility improve or contribute to your overall sort of FinOps strategy and effectiveness? So for us, it's been a challenge um, in the sense that it's a shared resource. And so seeing into that shared resource pool is the thing that really challenges us at New Relic, at least. And I think it's fairly common across the organi organizations, um, not just New Relic. Um, we see in our environment, we know like an instance belongs to a team in large respects, but the containers that run on, side, on top of that instance, we can't see into quite as well. We've, we've written some tools ourselves that scrape the Kubernetes data so that we can use New Relic to actually look at how much utilization do we have of the CPU? What resources is this team utilizing? We haven't connected all the dots yet on that because it's, it's, it's a journey to get to a place where we feel like we have accurate data across the, the estate about what's running and who owns it and who's running it, how much of the resources are being consumed by that particular team in, in, in our case. Gotcha, gotcha. And I think a, a good trick and a hint for everyone creating new software, if you're going to make a whole new concept, if you make it integrate with FinOps, you're going to get financial approval to buy the thing really well. You know, if we could go back and make this, sort of, of course, containers integrate well with FinOps, they would have sold terribly well. Um, so there are some challenges integrating with FinOps, but obviously the benefit is outweighing some of the challenges that you're getting and that that's the, the technical agility benefit far outweighs any sort of burden on FinOps. Is that the current sort of understanding? Yes, that is absolutely for us. Yeah, gotcha. And, and, yeah, I was going to say that it, it was kind of what I was alluding to in describing the different platforms for running containers, the, 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 that transition from running our own container orchestration platform to letting EKS run it for us. It, that saved us a ton of money. We don't have to own those EC2 instances and pay the monthly cost for the instances to run the control plane. It comes for free with the EKS platform in large respect. So, and that's, so now we just own the, the things below that's it. That's interesting in that you know, managed services are normally more expensive and there's always the, uh, the argument from the tech people, we're a special snowflake, we need to do all of this additional thing ourselves because we're so unique, unlike every single one else. Um, so the managed service component for containers was actually cheaper and like there was a, a very significant benefit with not much technical drawback to going to the managed service? We haven't seen a technical drawback from it. We, we were actually seeing more pain with owning that infrastructure ourselves, the, managing the upgrades, having to own that whole fleet and, and just deal with that additional layer of infrastructure on top of all the things that were already running. We, it, it just wasn't a business differentiator for us. I think that's the, the financial kind of aspect of it. But there was well. no significant increase in, in sort of financial cost to getting that managed service, like having someone else do it for you, like the figures were an absolute no brainer. It wasn't like you really had to think, well, it would cost us, we're paying a lot more here. Yeah, maybe it was just it was very, very clear that getting- It was, it, it was very, very simple transition. Gotcha. So almost like going, there was there was no argument. Yeah, it's like going back to the data center, having to manage all the hardware type of thing. Like it was literally that sort of different going from cloud to on prem. Yep. 
it, it allows the team that that was running that to focus on delivering the value that they need to deliver as opposed to just managing running the control planes and where with the I'll sort of ping you on that in terms of managing the control plane, but like it's on the cloud still, like we can automate all that management. It should be easy with patch management. Is managing control plane that hard? Like, is it because it's a slightly newer technology? It was a bit buggy. Why was that such a burden? We ran into some bugs and you're, you're going to take some, you're going to take some hits on your availability when you're doing that that work right and so that was the piece of it that we didn't want to have to deal with in in our infrastructure um, and if you wanted to remove those availability hits you'd have to what over provision a fair bit and actually spend a lot of money to to sort of combat that right gotcha gotcha um you spoke about agility you spoke about being able to offload a fair bit of the management uh, what are some of the other benefits uh, to going containers that you're actually seeing in the business? Or, or is that just they're so far ahead and so large that that's all you really need to know? Is there anything else? I mean, it, it is the de facto standard for us in, in large respects, right? Like there's no, we don't consider any other alternative. Um, our build and deploy pipeline is completely integrated into that process. So we wrote our own build and deploy pipeline into that, that whole set of infrastructure, builds the container images, deploys it out to production and up across the fleet. Uh, so we, it's, it's completely integrated into our software development lifecycle. So I, I think that's the other, like not necessarily the financial component of it, but that's the other piece of the puzzle that we utilize pretty heavily. Yeah, yeah. So it's got, you know, it's not just cloud first, it's cloud and containers or containers on cloud first, essentially. Does yeah. it also give you, uh, you know, obviously there's multiple cloud service providers out there that are doing containers does it give you some form of independence of a particular vendor and enable you to sort of potentially go to different vendors and you know avoid the dreaded vendor lock-in at all is that sort of a factor or hey it's a nice to have but it's not a driving factor not a driving factor i mean we're very interested in graviton in AWS today, just from the, the cost perspective that, that potentially lends. Um, so if we're building containers for that particular platform, you wouldn't necessarily have the same container that you could run in another in, in another cloud provider if they don't have that same architecture. Um, but if it's Intel architecture that you're building yep. for, the Intel architecture is going to be the same across clouds and you would get that economy of scale that you'd be able to just deploy the, the same thing to whichever provider you have. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, Ken, like they have been around for a while, the technology, I, I dare say, is as mature as anything at this point, as, considering how long it's been around. Can anyone take advantage of these or is this sort of something that you need to be of a slightly larger scale to be able to start to take advantage? Uh, you know, you mentioned a managed platform. You're looking sort of medium, large enterprises or even startups like, this is where everyone needs to start. You'd sort of be doing containers regardless of sort of size and capability. I think it's where you start. I think it's harder for the larger organizations to back into it than it is for the startup to, to start with it. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and is it easy enough to sort of, like when you're small, get started on them? It's just as easy as starting without containers or is there a bit of, uh, a hurdle at the very start to, okay, now I need to do containers, I need to understand them, or hey, look, there's enough people out there that understand it. It's like choosing any other technology as part of a solution, yay, nay, containers, and then go down there. I think it's I think it's the thing that you just do, right? Because the ecosystem is is rich enough at this point that you, you wouldn't have to have such a huge barrier to entry if you were starting out. Gotcha. So it's a case of like, choose the OS, choose the language, choose container and, and away you go type of thing. Yeah. yeah. Or, Especially if you're in a, in, a, in a cloud platform, right? Because you could then leverage ECS or EKS or something of that nature and just kind of, now you're just building that container and, and deploying it into your ecosystem, if you yeah. will. No, nice, nice. Um, okay. So let's look in terms of, they look great. They give us lots of benefits as we've spoken about. In terms of the downside, you know, 
They're, they aren't a magic bullet. They definitely do have some downsides to them. Um, what have been some of the issues that you've been through given you know, your you good history of working with containers? What have you seen yourself and what have you seen in the industry? Some of the issues that have been arising, you, know, you mentioned things like downside, downtime, sorry. Um, what else that's been hitting the business from these? It's, it's the isolation layers, right? Like the, the isolation between the containers is the thing that's, so security becomes a concern because you, you don't have that very distinct isolation that you would get with a, a traditional like a VM or with network. a traditional operating system. Yeah. Has that been... Because it's a shared resource. Yeah, has that been... It's, it's gotten okay. better. Yep. Yeah, and so, so, that, so that sort of initially was lacking or the understanding of how to do it was lacking? Initially, it was it was lacking, and it, it, it left a bit to be desired. And I think that's what slowed some of the early adoption for for companies because there there were the it's like oh well it doesn't do this like my VM does right so I don't want to move to that direction, um, but that's less of a concern for us today than it was say four years ago. We don't we don't have that conversation anymore internally. Yep, and in terms of how you'd approach that. Would you just spin up some more sort of, um, you know, sort of underlying bare metal? You, you've got different container sets that sort of like all the high security containers go in here or you group them by application so that they do reside. Like when you're at a larger scale, well, you're, you're going to group multiple containers together anyway. So then that gives you a, a clear sort of security boundary when you're at scale. Is that sort of a default approach you, you'd take to that? I think, yeah, that, that makes, I think that would be the way I would approach it. Gotcha. Um, so you mentioned before in terms of, you know, they're now another shared resource we have to unpick. You've built some, uh, some tools around that to try and get that. Um, what other issues are they causing FinOps? Uh, have you seen sort of many downsides to be able to execute a good FinOps strategy that the, the containers are sort of causing some grief with? I mean, we've had challenges. Are you know, we use a a a third party product to do cost visibility into our our cloud costs, and so that those containers present this opaque kind of landscape for us to be able to see into, um, and it makes our cost reporting not as accurate as we would like it to be. Um, so I think that's the struggle that we have right now is to be able to say yes, this particular thing is costing. N dollars per month to run, is that good or bad? Um, and so be, having that level of granularity and visibility is the thing that we really want to be able to see. That on top of that, like the shared network is going to be even harder to see, right? Like once we get to see the container, how are we going to know that like, oh yeah, and it's using X amount of that network interface that's available to the machine. And what do you think at the, is it because you've gotten onto that technology so early and so deep, you're asking more of it than everyone else. So, you know, the, the, no one can keep up with you because you went so hard. So expecting your vendors that provide these solutions to you as well in terms of, you know, giving you that insight, they haven't kept up with your pace or is it sort of the, the underlying technology and containers doesn't expose the information that it needs to? It, they, it, the information is exposed. We've been able to glean some of that information from the the pods and from the containers um, and Kubernetes, but we're not – the tools that we use, the traditional tools, do have not kept yeah. up. Yeah, so I'm making saying. sure that – like any early adoption, making sure all the vendors, all the supply chain keeps up with the pace and the technologies that you're using. And we've evaluated other vendors in the space. We're, we're – doing a POC now, the particular vendor, I don't want to give them a, a plug at the moment, but um, it's it, they have an interesting product that looks to solve some of that container visibility. One of the things that we're interested in is we have all those labels in Kubernetes on inside of the Kubernetes cluster, and we have these matching tags in EC2 land and taking those and, and marrying them together so that we can bridge that gap that is, exists for us today around those costs and be able to attribute the costs more effectively. Yep. And would it be, you know, if a service provider adds another service, well then, you know, you're going to have to go down the same. Is it that sort of level of additional complexity, detail and effort 
if you were sort of to consume a new service, yeah, I'm using the compute service. I now want to use this, you know, managed database service and need to understand a whole sort of new technology billing construct. Is it that sort of same magnitude of effort? I, I actually think it, it's slightly bigger than, than just understanding that, that transition between the two different kinds of consumption models that you have, right? I think it's, when you're using a managed service, they expose that data to you directly. It's just you different data, what, not having to, to create mappings on top of new data as well. There's sort of a two-step process. Right. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, it's time for the lightning round questions. Uh, so this is where we take a quick break from FinOps and we get to know our guest a little bit better. Some fast rapid fire questions. Mike, are you ready? I am ready. All righty. Uh, pineapple on pizza, yes or no? No. Cat person or a dog person? Dog. Red wine or white wine? Red. Beer or spirits? Yes. <laughs> Ask permission or beg for forgiveness? Beg forgiveness. Uh, favorite movie, director, producer, genre, any all of the above? Uh, Sci-fi in general. Uh, tea or coffee? Coffee predominantly. Uh, your favorite TV series, genre? Uh, Seinfeld. Uh, your favorite song, musician, uh, genre of music? Uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yeah. Uh, your favorite food? Pizza. Uh, when you go on holiday, do you prefer lots of activities or relax and do nothing? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Buildings and architecture or you prefer nature? Nature. Preferred superpower or supernatural ability? I don't have an answer for that one. Not a problem. Uh, favorite vacation location? Uh, Bishop, California. Uh, do you prefer to text or talk? Talk. Uh, your childhood nickname? I dare not say. <laughs> Your proudest moment. Uh, anything in life doesn't have to be work related. Uh, my kids. Excellent. Just... All righty. We have a solid score of 94. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. We will jump back into the world of FinOps and containers. Um, you mentioned before, uh, there's definitely some management overheads. Um, you know, is managing containers like managing virtualization, you know, you still have some form of sort of OS or code managing, which then has to sort of be patched and managed. Uh, is, is it that sort of level of management that's required for containers as well? Yes, we, we still do that type of, of work. In fact, we just patched our um, container or our, our Kubernetes to, to a newer version. So, and, and we're behind on that. Go figure. So is it like, you know, adding another operating system or this sort of replaces the effort of managing patching all the operating systems, so to speak, like from a business perspective, this sounds like a problem. I've got more management of go down to containers. Is it, or, or is it replacing something? It, it's, it, it's easier in some regard because what we were talking about patching there is just the Kubernetes layer. And so we don't have to touch the containers that run underneath and the containers get rebuilt frequently enough that, patching them kind of happens without us having to think about it as much. We also deployed a strategy for how we manage our infrastructure in the cloud, where the th we build these logical units of compute in AWS today. And when we build that, it has a, a shelf life. So rather than patch the things that live inside of that unit, we just say, in 90 days or six months, that unit will disappear and a new one will come in in its place and have all of the appropriate patches and things applied to it. So you don't have to go back for patches into those things. Ah, uh, okay. So you're essentially just sort of 
you're not having to repair the car. You throw the car away and just buy a brand new car and you jump on in it and off you go type of thing. Yeah. And we migrate the data because it's easier to migrate the data than it is to, to kind of go try and hatch those things because things become immutable when, the, when they're deployed in Kubernetes. And in terms of, you know, validation testing, things like that, is it still the same level of testing or because you're not doing a, a patching and all those changes, you know, less human error, less chances for bugs, it's an easier job and less effort in terms of all the testing and validation required. Absolutely. Gotcha. Um, in terms of, you know, you mentioned going to a managed service. If somebody comes up and tells a C-level exec, no, no, we can't use a managed first service because we're a special snowflake. Is there any, or have you come across in the industry, like any drivers that, no, 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 you know, you do need to manage it yourself so that you can tune this if you're doing something special with containers. Is there a good argument to be made not to go down a managed platform? So it, it, we're actually at a crossroads with that today with, uh, with Kafka, trying to figure out, you know, do we continue to run that in a managed platform or do we want to run that ourselves? We, we, we don't want to run it ourselves, to be fair, right? Like we, we did that in the data center. It's a lot of work. We know that. But is the managed service actually serving us to the best of uh, the best value for our investment? We still believe it does. Um, so we're, yeah, we're not yeah. quite there yet, but th that's, that's one of those places where we've looked at it and gone, hmm, is this the right place to do managed service or is it not? Yeah. Um, it, it, looking outside of New Relic, I think, the place where you see this happen most frequently for, for people is they is in the database realm where managing databases inside of a managed service works to a certain point, but it depends on what you're using your database for. If your database is large enough or has some performance characteristics that the, the managed service can't provide you with the functionality you need to ensure the uptime or the performance that you desire, then it may make sense to run it yourself because it's more cost effective to run it yourself in order to serve your business needs. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, so there's sort of high performance or high scale edge cases when you get to like a large enterprise, when you're sort of pushing the limits on size and you would typically start to hit limits of the usual cloud services. Is that sort of a trigger point you'd say? I'm not so sure that it's the large size of the corporation, but it's just the, the it's the use case of the of that infrastructure, right? You're using it beyond the limits of what the managed service was designed to, to kind of facilitate, and it becomes yeah. it just becomes exponentially more expensive because you're paying to your point earlier, you're paying that premium for someone else to manage it for you, and are you getting that value from that managed service that you actually need to to make good business sense for your business. Yeah, I understand, I understand. Um, and you mentioned, you know, the management uh, service for containers. Do you think, you know, in your opinion, would you say it's mandatory that the starting point is to get a managed service and then sort of the exception that you have to really strongly argue for would, would be to sort of self-manage? Would that be the right approach for businesses today? I think using the a orchestration platform that is managed does make sense running it yourself is an awful lot of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that should naturally fall to that sort of exception process and really have to justify that. Yep. Excellent. All right. So we've reached the halfway point in our show, and this week we're actually going to be splitting up our episode into two smaller bite-sized chunks. So that is it for this week. If you have any questions or any feedback of this show, please feel free to reach out to us at feedback at finopsfridays.com. And stay tuned for next week's episode.